Good evening, poultry keepers. Good to see everyone here tonight. And we got a good show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about grooming your birds for show. The last show we talked about conditioning, and now we're going to talk about grooming. And we've got the whole crew with us uh, tonight. Jeff and Melissa and Karen, welcome. Good to see all your smiling faces tonight. Um, well, I won't spoil that. Why don't we just go ahead and get started? We're going to be doing your questions along and along. So if you have a question, be sure to, to type it in for us and, and we'll do our very best to answer it for you. But um, let's get on with grooming our birds for the show. Right. Rev, can I ask a quick question before we get started? Can yes. you remind us what the difference between grooming and conditioning is? Well, conditioning really starts before the egg is laid. And conditioning is that long-term thing that we go through of taking a chick from a hatching egg, incubating, hatching, brooding, rearing, on up until maturity. So it's all those management processes, all the different feeding regimens, and all that goes into making a bird in good condition to show. Okay. Bodybuilding, feather growth, the whole nine yards. Gotcha. And grooming is that sort of last minute um primping and uh, preparation it's things like washing our birds and getting them all spit polished and shined up um coop training and and those sorts of things uh, but I, I that's that's kind of a to me it's a short-term process that we go through where con uh, conditioning is a much more long-term situation okay all right. All right. Are you ready for the next question, Rip? Lay it on me. All right. So, in your opinion, is it necessary to wash my birds before a show? Well, if you have white colored birds or lighter colored birds, uh, loose feathered breeds like Asiatics, or Cochins, Brahmas, uh, Orpingtons, or Silkies, yeah, it is. It is necessary. Some other colors may or may not be if, if you've got um, Rhode Island Reds or, or dark brown leggings, for example, and they aren't exceptionally dirty, uh, a quick going over with a, a rag and sprucing up their, their comb and their face and their legs may be all that you need. But if they look like they've been rooting around in the mud with the hogs, you probably need to wash even those dark colored birds. Okay. So speaking of washing, what is needed to wash these birds? Well, it's really pretty basic when it comes right down to it. You want about three tubs of water. You want warm water and now not hot. You don't want to scald the things, but warm water uh, with some soap in it of some description. Now, and I'll get into that in just a minute. In the second tub, you want to add uh, just plain water with a couple of splashes of, of vinegar in it for rinsing and that the vinegar will help cut the soap and, and get it out of the bird's feathers so they dry and look normal. And then the last tub is, is just this basic water and that will help rinse out the, the uh, vinegar and anything else. So you're gonna wash them once and you're gonna rinse them twice. Um, when it comes to soaps, I, I like, uh, I'm old fashioned, okay, I, I like to use a soap product. I don't like to use a detergent product. I know some folks wash their birds uh, with Dawn dishwashing detergent. Um, that's a pretty harsh thing. That, that will strip the oil uh, right out of the feathers on your birds. I mean, let's face it, at oil spills, that's the detergent of choice for washing Shorebirds that get oil all over them. They put them in that Dawn dishwashing detergent and they come out squeaky clean. And they uh, even have a little baby duckling on the yeah. on the bottle. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, what I like to use when I first started was I would get a bar of ivory soap mm -hmm. and grate it up on a cheese grater and then dissolve some into my tub of water and the how much depended on how big the tub of water was or how many birds I had to wash or how dirty they were. Um, 
but there's also some products on the market that I started using later on. Um, and it, it's for washing horses and it's called cowboy magic. Uh, that's some pretty good stuff. It doesn't strip the oils out of the feathers. Um, they also have some products for a little bit heavier duty use. Like if your birds are stained, mm -hmm. uh, they make one for green stains, which I'm assuming are grass stains and one for yellow stains. Um, which are going to be your your dirt and your mud and that kind of stuff. Now, when we're talking about stains, if you have a bird that is brassy, in other words, he has a, a yuck, the males have this yellow look in their hackles and in their saddles, that's not going to come out. That's, a, that's a, a, basically a genetic problem that you cannot wash out, and the only way to get rid of it is to wait until the bird molts. Now, there's some thoughts out there that it's brought on by feeding excess corn or too much greens. But if they don't have that genetic tendency towards brassiness, they won't turn brassy. I had some uh, white rocks that were silver-based, um, and they never, ever turned brassy. They always stayed nice and white. So in that... You said the first tub is soapy water. Mm -hmm. Like how much soap are we talking? Like how sudsy do you want? I don't want it to look like a bubble bath or anything like that. You uh, don't want that? No, 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 because that's too much trouble to get it out <laughs> once you get started. Um, you just kind of have to play around with it the first time or two till you find out what works for you. Like I said, it depends on how dirty are your birds. Uh, mm -hmm. If they're really dirty, you're going to need more soap. Right. How many birds are you going to try to wash before you have to throw that dirty water out and start all over again? Um, okay. I felt like if I could wash three birds in the same tub of water, I was doing pretty good. Um, and do you just use your hands? Yes. Right. And you you want to remember this is more, you're not scrubbing them by any stretch of the imagination because you're going to break feathers. But it's more like a a, a stroking and a rubbing, maybe but a light rubbing between your fingers to get the, the uh, dirt out. Uh, somebody asked me one time, said, how do you keep a white bird white? And I just feel back to what one of my mentors told me one time, you just don't let them get dirty, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is easier said than done sometimes. Yeah. But lots of good things bedding all the time. Gotcha. Okay. I think you might have covered this, but I um, can't hurt to hear it one more time. What is the basic washing process? Well, like I said, you start them out in that soapy water. Mm -hmm. um, you get the dirt off of them or out of them. Um, then you take them from that over into the rinse water with vinegar in it mm -hmm. and, and just work them up and down in that and, and use your fingers to loosen up the feathers and make sure you get that rinse water down in there so you get all that soap residue out and right. then from there you take them over to the uh, just plain water and just rinse them up and down in that a few times to get the vinegar I mean you don't want to take a bird that smells like a pickle barrel to a show uh, so I heard you're saying vinegar but I've heard some people using glycerin for something in the water is that uh and i know craig hansen does this in that last rinse he adds a little bit of glycerin okay to that rinse to kind of help keep the feathers soft and replenish any oils or anything like that i i didn't do coaching so i didn't do that i, I was doing white rocks um and i never felt like i really needed that um the one thing I will tell you, if you're just starting out to stay away from, and people will advise using bluing, laundry bluing in the water, and that is ticklish stuff to use. I mean, we're talking like maybe two or three drops, but some people think, oh, God, two or three drops, well, it's one, two, three. And what they wind up doing is permanently dyeing that bird a light sky blue color. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do to get it out until the bird molts. Yeah, that'd be a bummer. So, I, 
I would suggest folks, you know, stay away from that glycerin. It's bad stuff. You know, put the hex on it. Um, Speaking if, of proportions. Yes. I, do you have any idea how much vinegar to water? I mean, is it 50 to 1, 200 to 1? or? <laughs> you know, honestly, I used a highly scientific method. of. I took a gallon of vinegar. I took the top off and I went, one, two. And that's <laughs> So it's two yeah. gloves. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, everybody's a mountain horses and I do the same thing. You just got a, a couple gloves in, you're good to go. That's right. All right. We got a few questions here. We're really yes. getting washing, so let's do that. So Chase wants to know if the soap removes their oils from the removes oil from the feathers. Soap does not remove oil as bad as detergents remove oil. Can you give us examples? Um, ivory soap. You can still buy that. Okay. They make an ivory, ivory like dish soap. Would that be okay? Yes. As long as it says soap and not detergent on the bottle. Okay. Gotcha. That, that will be your guiding light there. If it says something like dish detergent, that's a little bit harsher chemical and that good chance it could probably strip the oils out of the feathers. Hmm. Kim. And we're we're doing this washing process just a few days uh, before the show, three to five days before the show. Uh, if you don't do it in advance, because they got to have time to dry out, get their feathers preened back into position in the whole nine yards. But that's three to five days is not really enough time for them to get much oil work back into their plumage from the, uh, from their oil gland. So that's some reason you want to be careful about trying to strip or stripping all the oil out of their feathers. All right, hold on. We got Matthew wants to know what the glycerin that you don't use, Rip. What what does it do for the bird? <laughs> it will help uh, replenish any lost oils. It makes the feathers a little bit softer. Think of it like conditioner for our well, for those of us who have hair, for your hair. Uh, or conditioner for a dog's coat or for a horse's coat or something of that nature. Uh, I'm sitting here trying to think, where does one buy glycerin? Is that in the grocery store? Is that oh, yeah. <laughs> you can get a, a, like a pint bottles of glycerin, a quart bottle. I, I don't know. Really? I think yeah. you can get it in bars from like tack shops. Uh, feed stores carry glycerin. Usually it's in the giant gallon size jugs and <laughs> Glycerin is something that a little dab goes a long way. I mean, you want just like a couple of teaspoonfuls in a in a tub of rinse water because it doesn't take much. You want enough to help replenish the oils, but you don't want enough to help make things sticky and gummy. Mm -hmm. So that's where you got to be careful using that. All right. We have a Shannon here always puts bug killer in the last rinse. I'm not quite sure. I'm thinking at first I thought like off, but now I'm thinking more like a poultry protector. Well, and, and I know where she's coming from with this. Okay. Uh, what I do when I coop in my birds, I carry some Adam's flea spray with me mm -hmm. and I give them one squirt at the base of the hackle, one under each wing and then one at the base of the tail um, and treat them that way before I put them in the coop. Does the does vinegar them. help with bugs at all? No, okay. not really. These are people helping me know that I'm just ignorant that I've not seen glycerin on the shelf, but it's available. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't know what it would look like either. It's just a clear liquid. Okay. okay. Just a clear liquid. There's a lot of things in the store I've never seen before. I'm finding that out. You need to get out and about in your local Wally world. There you Wander go. around. Okay, so... What happens if my bird is just filthy, covered in stains? What is the best thing for removing those stains? The best thing is to wash them just like you normally would mm -hmm. and then use one of those stain removal products, but go slow with it. Don't overdo it. Uh, some of it you can just spray on and then kind of rub it in and take it a little bit at the time because... Um, if you're dealing with tough stains, those chemicals uh, that they use can be a little harsher than just your regular soap that you're washing in. So you want to, you know, you want to kind of take it slow, do a little bit at a time, make sure you rinse it out really, really well. 
but uh, I know the Cowboy Magic products, the, um, I always use the one for yellow stains. Uh, that always did a pretty good if you got really dirty stains. Um, like I said, now that you're going to, sooner or later, you're going to run up with a stain that you just can't get out. Um, so you've got two options at that point. Take another bird to the show as a replacement <laughs> or take that dirty bird to the show, but I, probably not going to place because all the others are going to be nice and white. If, if it's a white bird. How close together can you bathe birds? So let's say you've got one that you washed it not near as clean as you'd like it to be. So you'd like to wash it again. Can you do it like within a couple days span or is that not ideal? You could, but I think if I had a bird, I thought I was going to have to do that with, Mm -hmm. I, rather than three to five days out, I would go five to seven days out for that first initial wash okay. and then do the second wash at about three to five days. That, yeah. And that's just me trying to be on the safe side mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, uh, I'll do, I'll wash him today and I'll wash him tomorrow. And it, it's Okay. Can I ask what, kind of stains do birds get and probably just because i've had black and dark red birds before but mm -hmm. what i mean if i had white birds i bet i'd know white <laughs> birds seem what? to have a penchant for getting into most anything that will stain them okay so mulberry trees or or just <laughs> you name it uh red clay will stain grass will stain um red clay even, even the sandy soil we have here in florida will stain a white bird if they're, if they're in it all the time. That's why so many people who raise white birds keep them indoors on pine shavings mm. that are changed frequently and that are stacked pretty deep. Okay. All right, Rip, I'm pretty excited for this question next. So uh -oh. how do I dry my birds after they're washed? You get those heavy industrial strength um, clothespins Mm -hmm. I'm, kidding. I'm kidding on this one. Uh, <laughs> That's the answer I wanted. <laughs> um, I would take mine out of the last rinse and, and mm -hmm. use my hand as the squeegee to try to squeeze out as much water as I could and then wrap them up in a uh, an old beach towel or something like that, a, a bath towel. Um, some folks refer to that now as chicken burritos because all that's left sticking out is their head. Oh, that's um, they will leave them in that and let the towels soak up as much mm -hmm. uh, moisture as it can out of them. Mm -hmm. I like to let my birds dry naturally. So after I removed them from the towel, I would take them and put them back in a coop with heavy pine shavings. Mm -hmm in a warm area. Uh, and I say warm because sometimes we're showing it's winter time and it can get quite cold. So you don't want them to catch a cold or anything like that, but you want to make sure it doesn't have to be like 85 or 90 degrees, you know, 75 degrees will work. All right. So if, what if I want them to dry like immediately, <laughs> can I use a blow dryer? You can, but, Oh, really? It's kind of like bluing. You have to be really, really careful with it. Okay. Now, breeds that are commonly used, uh, a blow dryer on them are silkies, cochins, mm -hmm. the Asiatics, uh, loose, loose feathered breeds. Okay. Because what you can wind up doing with a uh, blow dryer, if you're not careful, is you can take a bird that is fairly... Um, close feathered or tight feathered like like mm -hmm. a Rhode Island red and you can make them very loose feathered looking because most folks use a blow dryer and they are holding the bird here with a head here they don't go like this okay. they turn that bird around and so they you want to go and with the feathers you want to go saying. with the lay of the feathers or you're, you're going to have a puffy looking bird on your hands that mm. is not going to do well in a show okay all right. So the million dollar question then is once they're all clean, how do they stay clean? Again, I would put mine back into the show coop on uh, deep litter and that you have to be pretty religious about taking the poop out because fresh poop will stain a freshly washed bird 
faster than you can imagine. Oh, now, one, one thing that I learned is that if you keep them on a, a grain-based diet from the time you wash them until you bring them home from the show, that helps tighten and firm up the poop so it's not quite as messy and they're less likely to get stained by it. But you still got to get it out of there because I guarantee you they're going to lay down in it. They're going to roll over in it. They're going to try to dust bathe in it. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things you, you know, you put your little latex gloves on and go on poop patrol. So you have to take the whole week off of work, right? So that you can no, that's hourly, not like that bad. hourly get out there. And I'm assuming you pen everybody individually at this point. Yes. They're all in yes. their own. So is the chicken's first reaction to getting wet to do have a dust bath afterwards? <laughs> Uh, no, because they're usually still pretty wet. Okay. So they're, they're more interested in, you've seen chickens after they get rained on. Yeah. So what are they doing? They're, sitting over they're kind of preening all the feathers back in place. So they're going to be doing pretty much that. Okay. But there, there will come a point they will eventually want to dust bathe. Okay. All right. So... Rip, is there an easy way to keep their shanks and feet clean? The easiest way to clean them, and it's time consuming, and I, I know it because I've done it numerous times, but let them soak, let their, their shanks and their feet soak in this warm, soapy water. Mm -hmm. um, and then take a soft bristle brush, like a toothbrush, and just keep brushing and trying to get that dirt out from between the scales. If they've spent their life out on the, the sandy soil, powdery soil that we've got here in Florida, it's really gonna be packed up under there. <clears throat> and then you're gonna have to use something like a, a toothpick or a, a ladies, um, an orange stick like ladies would use to, to clean out the cuticles on their fingernails, something of that nature. You don't want to use anything sharp because you don't want to make them bleed, right. um, but something of that nature. And there is um, something you can make that will make that job easier. Um, it's called a, a grooming sling. And I've posted about it in our group, Poultry Keepers 360. If you go on there and just search the group for grooming sling, and all it is is a rectangular piece of heavy cotton duck material with two holes cut out for legs and you just fold it up around the bird and then you hang it hmm. and that way you can turn the bird any way you want to you've got two hands free um, I use a, a, a dog grooming table and use the, the grooming arm mm -hmm. uh, to hang the, the bird in the sling from okay makes life a lot easier than trying to figure out how you're going to hold a bird and a leg and get after him with a, a little, one of those cleaning sticks. Okay. Not an easy task. So if you don't have help, then is it's that the best life way saver. about that? Okay. It is a lifesaver. Gotcha. All right. Well, then what about cleaning their face, combs, waddles, and earlobes? Uh, I do that, <clears throat> excuse me, when I'm washing them. I'll take that same soft bristle brush and I'll lightly go over. Oh, you it. found it. Yay. Oh, yes. I'm uh, so glad you found that, Karen. So yeah, just, there's just one the slit in there, right? Just a single slit that both legs are sticking through. Uh, look in the center picture, the one up above. I don't know why they drew it that way, but there's actually two. Okay. I can't make it any bigger. But, um, okay. I see but give their face a light scrubbing because they're going to accumulate dry dead skin on there and it's going to look white and make them look pasty you want to get that taken off um and not do that to their to their face to their comb <clears throat> to the waddles and to the earlobes so you don't just hold their head underwater in the first of the three no because okay. it, it takes a little bit of a scrub scrubby dub dub get all that dry skin off. I think you could use it now with all the electric toothbrushes. Do you think that would be too rough if you used 
not the like water picks, but like the you know just yeah. a little. Oh, I don't know why it wouldn't. You know, vibrating just, one. just make sure you've got a soft bristle. Is that so might how, even work I want to use a way? power tool for everything. <laughs> <laughs> How well do the birds handle being handled like this? Does it take? I imagine it takes some time. I t I t I'll tell you something, Alyssa. You would be amazed at the number of times I have put a bird in that warm, soapy water and they will literally go to sleep. Really? Yes. Once they get used to it, man, they just kind of like me in a hot tub. I just go limp. And just <laughs> like a spa. Relax. All right. Are right, you ready for the next question? Mm -hmm. Okay. So is there anything that can be put on the clean feathers to make them shine? There is. Mm -hmm. And I hate it. Uh, no. <laughs> I think you might have mentioned that in the last we show. We talked about this uh, on our last live stream. Most folks call it the pink spray. And it's a, a hair care product uh, that really builds a nice shine. And they make Simply, they make a, a product, I believe it's called Shoshin, mm -hmm. for spraying yep. on cattle and horses and that kind of stuff. But if you overdo it, it's literally hard to hold the chicken. And I, and I have come very, very close to dropping chickens before that were, they used too much. I mean, they hose those things down in that Shoshin. Um, and if it gets on slick concrete, mm you can create a, a very dangerous slip and fall hazard for people as well. Okay. So what I find rather than spraying on the chicken, like most folks do is I carry a silk grooming cloth with me when I go to a show, just a square silk handkerchief and I'll spray just a little bit on that and then rub that with the lay of the feathers on the chicken. Hmm. The other thing is, it's one of those products that if you use too much of it, uh, it will attract dust. It will actually stick to the chicken. It'll draw it right out of the air. It's uh, the opposite of what you're trying to do after exactly. you just clip them. It makes them look dull. Mm. All right. All right. What about their combs? Anything to put them on there to make them look nice and red? Red lipstick, something like that. I forgot. Wait. No, you can't. <clears throat> Remember, you can't add color to a chicken. That's oh, called right. Flaky. Uh, but there are all sorts of comb dressing recipes out there. Uh, I know folks use a product called Vetrex that's sold as a treatment for respiratory everything. illnesses. And, uh, <laughs> it's a treatment for absolutely everything. I know it. You know, it's, it's like Thailand. Uh, but you want something that's a little astringent and that has a little bit of oil in it. Mm -hmm. Um the guy who shared this with me when I was like 18 years old, I've been using it ever since I take a small dropper bottle and fill it halfway with alcohol. Vodka rubbing. Wow. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I'm trying to get through this. Y'all I really am. <laughs> fill it halfway with alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Thank you very much. And uh, the rest of the way, with olive oil and then okay. shake it up and then put a drop or two on my fingers and rub it between my fingers and I'll rub it on their combs and their wattles and their earlobes and their, rub it around on their face. You don't want to get too much on there. I've actually seen where somebody put too much on a bird's head right up here next to the comb and it sort of matted down the feathers. Mm -hmm. uh, he like only had reserve show champion. That bird would have been show champion had that not been done. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's kind of like brill cream, you know, a little dab will do you, a little bit goes a long way. Right. But just simply rubbing alcohol and olive oil, cheap, effective. Most of us have got it in our homes already anyway. What does the rubbing alcohol do? So why are you mixing those two it together? It makes your combs red. It's, it's that astringent quality. Okay. And then the oil just makes it shiny? It just like makes it shiny. Almost. Mm -hmm. And you're... Okay. Now you're talking about doing that, what, like minutes before they close the aisle for the show? or uh, Usually or? I would do that. I bring my bird. I do it when I coop in my birds originally okay. for the first time. Now, I try to get there in time to go back over my birds before judging starts 
you know, is there, have they gotten dirty somehow? Do I, do I need to address that issue? Do I need to get after them with something like some wet wipes and try to get as much of that off as I can? Uh, do I need to touch up their combs or their wattles? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Okay. I've also seen folks use uh, uh, Vicks Vapor Rub and rub that on the comb for the same reason. You know, it's, it's got all that menthol in it, and that'll make a comb really redden up. Okay. So would you use that, or would you use your alcohol and olive oil mixture? Which do you think I use my that? olive oil and alcohol. It just... Some things I like change, some things I don't. That's one thing I, I don't like change. I've been using it yeah. for almost forever. Um, Would the smell of the VIX put off a judge? No. Okay. I smell it frequently when I'm judging birds. The only thing that will put off a judge is the smell of a Sharpie. Of what? A Sharpie. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Where they've tried to color in the white tip of a feather, which is... Mm -hmm illegal or something of that nature. All right. What about their legs now? Is there any I use the same thing, the same olive oil and alcohol. Okay. Um, I, I might spend a little more time buffing it. And, I, you know, and I just happened to remember this. I had a good friend uh, who was an automobile mechanic who worked in, in a, a car dealership. And when they got the mechanics rags back in from being cleaned, they brought them back in they had all been treated with lanolin mm -hmm. and that's what he used to rub his birds down with and his uh the legs their feet their bink not bink beak um and that lanolin would really brought out the shine okay all right hold on we got a breaking news question from oh. Diana. All right, should you just use the olive oil on a silky since you specifically don't want to make the comb red? You can. Um, I found that thinning it and that that is not going to make the comb red on a silky. I don't believe. I'm, I've, I've never tried it, but I can't imagine that it would. But I think if you delete that, d delete, dilute the olive oil slightly with a little bit of alcohol, it will make it easier to to apply. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, I would suggest, Deanna, that you go to a silky exhibitor mm -hmm. and say, what should I use? What do you use? What is safe to use? You're doing better than me. I'm sitting here trying to go, is there silkies have a comb? That's yes. <laughs> that's, so. They do. So if they didn't have a silky exhibitor they could go talk to. I guess that you could try it like, I don't know, a couple of weeks before, see what happens. I, I would try it, I think, on a bird that I wasn't going to take to the show. Okay. Um, that way, if it messes up, you haven't messed up yeah. your valuable show prospect. Right. Okay. Someone throw a question in there for Jeff so we can make sure that he's still awake. So, <laughs> go on. How, how do you mean that's for me? How do you make your legs? <clears throat> no, I'm you know, saying no. I'm saying that I want somebody to throw a question in there so that oh, okay. you can feel. So I was gonna say that, that's not my question. No, I know. But. I thought you had one. We were all waiting. <laughs> no, no. I want somebody to ask something. Huh? All right, Jeff. Is there anything that you can feed a bird to make them shiny? <laughs> there you go. Um, and I was going to interject this way back, but I hate to get rip off track. So. Uh, <laughs> Not hard you know, to do. <clears throat> I was sitting here trying to find out what what it what the actual what what the healthy oil level of a chicken feather is supposed to be. Uh, couldn't find much, but it says about six percent. And um, mm. you know, so on some of the nutritional stuff, when we've talked about it, you know, you, people have heard me say I like to see the diet at five percent. Uh, that way, I know that that oil gland is working. You know, at at, at a higher level. Um, but yeah, poultry feathers. So if the diet has the correct type and amount of fat in it, that should help keep those legs nice and shiny. So, <clears throat> but it's also going to be a little bit of a function because they're scales of keratin. So making sure that you have, uh, some good keratin type ingredients in the feed, which most feeds don't have, but, um, other than what comes from corn. 
Uh, but you know, anytime the corn's getting diluted, then you're going to be reducing the amount of keratin that's being transferred. But I, I would think that oil in the feed and keratin content are going to be the top two feed components for making legs shinier. Okay. All right. Well, speaking of feed, oh, go on, Rip. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to ask Jeff, um, and I had mentioned that it's just I found out from experience that feeding a, a grain-based feed um, helps tighten up the the stools and all that and easier to care from it from that standpoint is am i off base with suggesting they do that i you know i don't want to screw up their normal routine diet but i mean we're talking about a period of maybe three to five days well so I've seen what you're talking about. And when people feed crumbles and pellets, the manure tends to be a little more pudding like, right? Less firmness to it. Yeah. <clears throat> and people that are feeding a grain based diet, what we call a mash feed, doesn't have to be whole grain. Um, I see a, a, a better density, uh, a more firmness to manure. I see that all the time. So, I mean, what you're telling them is true. I just, I don't know that I want people running out to buy a whole grain diet, you know, with whole kernels of corn and peas and, you know, um, something that looks like a bowl of Fruit Loops that doesn't have a whole lot of nutrition to it. So, <clears throat> yes, the grain diet is going to give you a better manure, you know, dryness or firmness or it's going to make it a lot easier for you to clean it out of the show pen. That's for sure. Versus, you know, a crumble or a mash. But a but diet gotcha. change the week before sounds also a possible problem. Like you're gonna throw that bird into mold, or you're gonna. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great segue into our next question. So, should they be fed like normal then? Yes and no, and um, what can happen at a show? is they will feed them their normal amount of feed or a lot of times they'll go through and they, and I encourage folks to take a, uh, a feed cup with them, their own feed cup, because most shows don't provide those because you don't want to feed a bird on the floor of the coop because then they start scratching around and when they scratch, they back up and when they back up, they jam their tail into the wire and, and screw up the look of that. But they'll just fill up that cup full of feed uh, and hang it on the side of the coop in the mornings, what can happen if, if your bird is hungry, you know, they'll really go after the food. And then all of a sudden it looks, their crop starts to look like they have swallowed a baseball. Mm -hmm. And that throws off the look of the bird for the judge. So okay. what I would just say do is you don't want to cut their daily amount of feed, but maybe just give them a smaller amount before judging starts. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after their judge, you can, you can go ahead and fill up the cup and hang it in there if you want to, okay. but uh, that's, so, uh, did you feed a whole grain diet whenever you were showing? Actually, what I would take was a, um, a pelleted ration and mm -hmm. mix that about 50% with a good scratch. Okay. Not okay. knowing then what I know now. But I, th I think after just having listened to Jeff, I would probably just kind of graduate everybody over to a a, uh, a good mash diet and let it go with that. Are there different protocols for feeding? I, I mean, how much control do you have? Are somebody going to run around and put different feed in your bird's cage or anything? That used to be the standard deal. Uh, show management would walk down the aisle with a bucket of scratch feed and throw a handful in each pen. Well, where are they throwing it? Right on the bottom of the, um, the coop. What I started doing was writing on their owner will feed in a, a bright, like a red marker or something like that. To get their um, attention. Yeah. Because some shows do, some shows don't. It just, Mm -hmm. depends on the look of the draw and how that show decides to do things. And I'm thinking, 
part of my problem is in North Carolina, the state fair, the poultry are there for what? Five days, five, six days. You have to leave them there to show in the, now that's not a normal APA show, but I'm like, surely somebody's feeding those birds there, you know, with, without permission. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, but usually it's the folks trying to feed them corn dogs and cotton candy and all that. <laughs> stuff. There you go. That's, That's good. good for them, right? Yeah. Mm. All right. So what about, I'm excited about this question too. So we're going to switch gears a little bit from feed and going back to grooming. What about grooming waterfowl? You know, waterfowl, when it comes right down to it, are probably the easiest birds of all to groom for a show. As long as you keep them relatively clean, you know, if they're not walking around in, in mud or wet grass all the time, uh, really all you need to do, and I, you know, I've got some good friends that they have calls. Now, admittedly, they keep their calls in wire bottom uh, coops, and they just put a like a little dish pan of water in there, just plain water, and they just let them bathe and splash around and have a good time, and they'll dump that out and give them some fresh water. And in a day or so, those things are spit shined. They, I mean, they look great. So as long as they have access to water to bathe in, not much you really have to do. I mean, you want to give her the beaks of going over and, and make sure they're clean. Uh, the same thing for for their feet and their, for their legs. Um, but they're pretty easy keepers to get ready for a show, by and large. We lost Alyssa's volume. Come back. Ta -da. <laughs> Tell us again. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Rip, I missed that. Did you say that you do bathe them or you don't? Or I, I don't. I don't bathe them. I don't use soapy water. I'll just give them a tub of water and let their them do their ducky and goosey things, mm -hmm. uh, and and they'll do it themselves. Really? Yeah. So they'll get nice and white. You would be they amazed they at the number of waterfowl that are smuggled in. I probably shouldn't say this out loud. Smuggled into motels at night and given free range in the bathtub for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, How fun! Could you imagine if you walked in and saw that? That'd be awesome. Mm, happens more than you would imagine. <laughs> I bet you the hotel rooms in in Ohio are not thrilled about it. Yeah, <laughs> or uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, mm. as a friend of mine can attest to, they tried to smuggle in a white china goose. <laughs> Obviously, you like I said, you still need to do face. I mean, or you still need mm. to do feet and. Nails. I had Muscovies. I can't even imagine trying to get their nails clean. Muscovies, those those things can hurt you with those yeah. claws that they have on their feet. Uh, and Muscovies are certainly not a breed that I would recommend for young kids because they they can scratch you badly and, and mm. lacerate your arms if you're not careful. But turkeys, guineas, they treat the same as chickens? But pretty much the same as chickens. I don't know. I never washed my turkeys when I showed them. I don't really know of anybody who did. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I didn't. All right. All right. You ready for some questions from the, from the peoples? Yes, by all means. <laughs> all right. So what is the ideal length for a chicken's toenails? Gosh, I I, uh, I don't know that there's an ideal length. I know when you're clipping it back, I would try to clip them back to where there was, obviously you don't want to clip it into the quick because then it's going to start bleeding. But I also didn't like to leave um, a straight across cut on the toenail. I, I would like to round it over a little bit just so it looks natural like you put a beak or something or a spur or something of that nature. Would you, you file be... that? I'm sorry. Would you file it after you cut it? Or just oh, I'm, I'm right here and I like power tools. You just get a little. <laughs> okay. Except little I normal. use battery operated. She goes the, the 120 route. Um, 
Was he? Are you cutting nails and trimming spurs and stuff just for the show, or would you recommend people keep on that year round? I do that routinely, and that's something I talked about. I think we might have talked about it last week. Mm -hmm. That when I'm going through my birds, I usually have uh, a heavy duty toenail clipper on a string around my neck. And if I see a beat that's getting too long, I can just grab the bird up and snip, snip, snip. Or if the toenails are getting long, I, I can uh, trim those back as well. The spurs, I would usually use a dremel too long. I have a question later that I don't know that you'll answer. So we might about faking, but uh, no problems with beak trimming. You're okay to trim beaks as much as you want or as little as you want for showing? Well, you, when you trim it, you want it to look natural and balanced on the bird's head. You, right. you know, you don't want it to look like it's been. Um, <laughs> yeah, but if you have a, there could be some, are there any defects of the beak that you would, could hide by trimming? Not really, right? No, uh, not really. A, a good judge, you know, some folks have tried that with crooked beak, but it doesn't, it's not hard to spot that. That wasn't personal. I just was curious. Um, let's see. Um, I believe this was back to the cowboy magic people. I think they have a green spray that she yes. was saying that they like for the day of. So just sharing that. Okay. All right. JS is trying to make me feel better by asking what department of a store for the glycerin? Cleaning supplies? Personal care? Um, body soap? That's a good you question. Find it kind of associated with the first aid and health care oh, like by the band-aids and the yeah. and the hydrogen peroxide etc mm -hmm. there we go so i think my use of glycerin is very different from what is standard so what else is glycerin used for if it's in the first aid area this also isn't relevant sorry it's for it's lighting after. things on fire i think no it's not <laughs> <laughs> no oh i, well, you know, I you really don't know Okay. What do you use it for? You have to share since you said that. We used it to like clean tack. Okay. Like clean and yeah. like leather. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make candles. No, I'm saying that. Exactly. <laughs> That's what we do in Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. We talked about this for a minute, but I think Jeff might have an opinion on this too. So I've heard that the sun can make white birds yellowish. Is that true? I guess it's all the list of things that can make white birds yellow. So I think you said earlier, Rip, that you didn't that you thought brassiness was partially genetic. Yes. Okay. Uh, now, can certain things make it worse? I think so. Diets high in corn, uh, access to a lot of fresh green feed seem to make it worse. Sometimes even exposure to sunlight seems to make it worse. But it's because they have that initial genetic propensity towards brassiness is, is really what starts it. And is there anything feed-wise, Jeff? That, I mean, is the whole give your dog, dog, give your bird too much corn and it's going to turn it yellow. And they're trying to use corn to yellow their legs up, so... Right. And, and Rip, you know, Rip was absolutely correct that so in a diet that would be really heavy on corn and also in a group of birds that was out on some really nice green grass. I mean, you're just you're piling in a bunch of, uh, you know, pigmentation and carotenoids. Um, and, and so, yeah, you, you're going to stand that chance. And. Also, if they're exposed to a lot of direct sunlight, it's going to help pop that pigment, you know, up out of the skin. So feather, feather pigment is actually, for the most part, laying in underlying in the skin. And it's waiting for that opportune moment or the right circumstances for it to show up. You know, and I, I just recently learned this um, with the iridescent, you know, the folks that are working on the iridescent, you know, poultry projects. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's actually a genetic composite or, you know, a genetic factor, um, that's laying within the skin 
um, but it has to have the right precursors or the right triggers in order for it to come out. Hmm. So, <clears throat> it, you know, and I believe the same is true for, you know, folks that want white birds, you know, that, that underlying, you know, potential can be there. And then under the right circumstances, I think you can make it pop out. Um, but yeah, definitely corn's going to do it. Um, you know, putting them out in direct sunlight, which chickens aren't really happy in direct sunlight anyway, for more than, you know, half hour, 45 minutes and, um, <clears throat> and fresh, lush green vegetation are going to, are going to enhance the opportunity for that color, but it's somewhere in the genetics, uh, you know, somewhere that potential is in the genetics from somewhere previously. Now, if you keep them in a barn, you keep them in the shade, you know, you feed them commercial feed that doesn't have a lot of corn in it, you know, chances are you may never see it, but you know, somebody could have a long family of, you know, perfectly white birds and, you know, it could still be there. I mean, I, I hate to say that somebody's going to send me hate mail and I'm sorry that I had to say that, but <clears throat> Yeah, um, yeah. It part of it is genetic, part of it is feed. So, all right, we're gonna stick with the thing. So, Shaggy was, has has a fish oil supplement. How far in advance of a show should I start giving it to make a difference? So, I guess I don't know I'm what exactly you're trying to change. Yeah. Well, okay. So, um, in the world of a chicken. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get hate mail for this too, but here it here it goes is um, oil is oil is oil is oil, right? And there's people out there that are like, oh my, I gotta have extra virgin olive oil, or I gotta have extra virgin coconut oil. Look, coconut oil and olive oil are probably the top two. And there's nothing wrong with fish fish oil either, Shaggy. So if you want to use that, use that. Um, but I'm here to tell you that once it goes in the bird's mouth and it gets processed by the bird's liver, it's going to send the oil where it needs to go. But I think you want a consistent diet that is between 6 and 8% total fat most of the time, or at least a 30 to 45 day lead to the show to get the oil content built up. So the oil gland is doing its job, right? To get the look on the feathers, to get that wetter, wetter look, you know, um, on those feathers. I think you're going to need at least a month. No, whether it's fish oil, whether it's olive oil, whether it's coconut oil, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> as my old friend says, I don't have a dog in this fight. So you do what you do, what works for you. But I just hate to see people spending top dollar for, you know, some of the different oils out there, wheat germ, fish oil, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know that there's a, enough of an advantage to pay the premium price for those products. All right. Now I have a Karen question and a follow-up Karen question. So let's talk about cages. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, when I first got chickens, bought show cages and put my birds in them being the only birds I had were black ostrilorps and everything was fine in the world. And I didn't think anything of it. But one time I took my cages to a place where we did like a little show and like I put some colored dorkings in those cages and they about killed themselves. Um, so I feel like my birds were just lazy and fat and could care less where they were standing. But how much, how are you, do you have to train your birds to behave yes. in the cages? Do you? Yes. Okay. How do you we do that? We call that coop training. <laughs> okay. And... I will coop train several birds at a time. Each bird is cooped individually. Mm -hmm. What really sets them off and gets them to go bonkers is when they're in the coops and there's strange people around there that they aren't familiar with. That will really set them off. I judged a class of probably 30, 35 Buff Orpingtons one time, and they were maniacs. I, I literally had to manhandle each one out of the coop because they hadn't been trained and they hadn't learned that people were not there to pinch their heads off. Uh, but every time I would walk up to the cage, the birds would go ballistic. So it's just a matter of investing some time and getting your birds in the coop. Uh, and, and even if you've got a friend that will come over and 
even just walk up and down in front of the birds with you. So they get uh, used to seeing strange people. So nothing, nothing more than just, uh, there's no more to training them than just doing it, just exposing right. them to it. You right. know, you're not, you know, you're not doing treats or anything special. Mm -mm. All right. Okay. Second cage one is, I swear you once talked about training your birds to pose. Yes. For the judge. How does one do that? It helps if they're a little bit on the hungry side. Um, and I'm not one for using treats a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a believer of, of adding to the diet when we're, we're feeding a good high quality feed. It's not necessary. Uh, but I will say that nothing will grab a bird's attention faster than holding a mealworm, a live mealworm between your fingers and they're flopping around and wiggling. You have that bird's undivided attention. Uh, you can teach the bird to stand higher by raising your hand up, or if he's too tall, you can bring him down a little bit. But you want him to come up to, towards the judge. I would train mine to pose from the side. I always, always gave him the treat from the side of the coop because when they're taking the treat from the side, then they're showing the judge their side view, which is the best view. Uh, think about that but there's a stance you're looking for though right if you go to a show all right re remember i pointed out one of your males to you when i was up there and i said that bird has a natural pose yeah do you remember what it was with one of his feet further forward than the other but his foot on the off side was slightly in front about oh about like the measurement of his foot was slightly in front of the other and he always stopped in the same position the same foot forward he was alert he wasn't alarmed but he was alert and he did, he was a natural poser <laughs> sorry natural poser I made me laugh all right so craig talks about the cage training that you can use a radio exposing yes. to different sounds and different stations um i have found with my birds in the cages that if you put them in the cages when it's dark and then as it gets light, that's a little bit alarming for them. So, I mean, how long are we talking about? I mean, are you talking about putting them in the cages? I mean, the same cages you're putting them in after their baths, like so you could have them in there for days at a time or or a few hours? Uh, a lot of it is dependent upon the breed. Okay. You know, reds are going to settle down in a coop much faster than Anconas or, or Leggerns or something of that nature. Um, but two to three weeks, you know, you, you can, um, old timers used to describe it. You can leave them in there too long to where they just don't want to do anything. And, and they call that coop weary. Hmm. They just didn't like being in there. They didn't show well. So yeah, you, it's like anything you can overdo it. Okay. What do you do? And this is again, an ignorant question from a non show person. Like if you put them in there after the baths for days, like, is there a root? I mean, you put a roost in there for them or did they just all no. of a sudden they're sleeping on the shavings? The coops are not big enough to, to have That's a roost. True. That's true. Um, and, and when you say for days, if I'm washing a chicken three days before a show, I'm cooping that bird in on a Friday night, probably. So I'm washing that bird Tuesday evening. Okay. So that's, you're talking about a four day run there before he's judged maximum. So that's, that's not an inordinate amount of time. And one thing going back to uh, what Craig said about using the radio. Uh, I even, I think I still have it as a matter of fact, I recorded some audio at an actual chicken show that I played on a loop. So they were accustomed to the sounds of a show and it was the chickens crowing and the people talking and the turkeys gobbling and the, the guineas guineaing and, and uh, all of that. So uh, 
whether it helped or not, I don't know, but it made me feel better. I, I felt like it did. Yeah. I, think Ma I think Matt's, Matthew's asking, how do you know when to stop with the case so that you don't end up with the coop weary? It's probably bird specific, right? You just observe the way they're behaving. It, it is a little bit. Um, I don't start coop training birds until probably, again, depending on the breed, two or three weeks before a show. And then when they, when I bring them back home, they don't go back in that coop. They go into a, a quarantine pen. Yes, loves your idea about the worms. Talked about how similar posing is to dogs. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Just like baiting a dog. Yeah. Although bait dog, that scared me for a second. Then I, <laughs> then I saw it different. Um, and I'm thinking Craig's saying that he's got birds into cages for shows in six weeks. Some some breeds are more feather specific than others, right? Yes. <laughs> that, yes. So, um, all and right. Craig's then, got cock, uh, Craig's got cochins, and and they're more laid back than some other breeds might be. Um, and this is I had one last note on my thing that I put down, and Craig went right into it for me. So let's see. Getting them clean at home is key, but transporting them in proper containers so they arrive with minimal grooming needed prior to show. So yes, I think you told us before what you like to transport in. I like a wooden box, uh, solid wood with wire in the front for ventilation and some holes in the back. Mm -hmm. And I like it narrow enough where the birds cannot try to turn around. Because when birds start turning around is when they start messing up feathers. And I just cringe. I see so many people showing up for the poultry show with chickens in dog crates or turkeys in dog crates. Invariably, what's going to happen is they're going to flop around in those dog crates, taking them in or out. And they're going to mess up their plumage. But if they're in a solid wooden box, they don't have to. I'm not talking about making it out of one by two real thin plywood like a um, uh, sheet of Luan that's thin like they put on um, interior house doors. Uh, that and a little half or three quarter inch spurring strip framework is all you really need. Uh, I, I see folks using plastic uh, tub containers and they'll bore some little holes around the side but invariably if birds stay in there very long you're going to see a lot of condensation showing up there yeah. and that will wind up saturating your birds when they roll up on it i built i when i took my well summer flock to kansas we built a bunch of uh, sort of wooden cages like you're describing out of pegboard so all around the three sides were pegboard with just a wire front. And that worked pretty well. I felt like it was good ventilation. Obviously not long-term getting wet <laughs> would be not be a solution, but I didn't have to drill a million holes. That was nice. <laughs> um, all right. This is an excellent question. We are finishing up, everybody. Sorry, but rip, we're over an hour, Rep. You okay? That's okay. That's okay. All right. What do we need to pack for the show other than the bird? This is a really okay. good one. I agree. I like to bring my feed and my water from home because they're used to that feed. Chances are if they have feed available for you to use at a show, it's going to be scratch feed. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky, they might have some laying mash, but I, I wouldn't depend on it. Bring your own feed and water, your own feed and water cups. I like to bring a silk cloth, my little container of olive oil and rubbing alcohol. Uh, um, I carry just a, a little thing of wet wipes because invariably they're going to get dirt on them that you're going to have to try to remove and take off. Um, some folks carry along, like she was talking, a uh, lady was talking about there earlier about the spray on green spray. Uh, if they're, I like to think of having to do a touch up job there and not having to do a whole wash because if you're really washing that entire bird you got a wet chicken on your hands and they're not going to place well in the show so the least amount of water you can get on your birds at that point the better off you're going to be 
um, just basic. Um, I, I take my Adams flea and tick spray. Nothing, nothing elaborate. Toothbrush. Yes, Greg. Thank you. For you or the birds? <laughs> Both. Both. <laughs> Maybe Craig can tell me if I can use an electric toothbrush on them. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right. That was good. Like that. Any paperwork or anything you normally need to take, or is that all handled ahead of time? Um, it can vary from show to show. I would always carry my NPIP paperwork with me, just in case they had lost it or something, which would also happen from time to time. Um, plus, you you probably need it when you're crossing state lines if you stop at the agricultural inspection station. So it's always good to have that with you. Always carry a copy of your entry with mm -hmm. you when you go so there's they can say no nah, no you you said you were entering barred rocks and i said no nope, right here mm -hmm. rhode island red but um nail clippers i mean but just getting into things people said before oh, yeah. Let, take your entry form to coop when loading birds there you go mm -hmm. all right good job rip and greg and, and i you also use a small tackle box to put all that stuff in so it was easy Makes to lug sense. around all right lloyd wants to know how to find shows near him poultry show.com hmm. poultry shows Oops. central poultry show is it uh, poultry? Poultry, poultry show central um okay but there's a couple of sources out there apa list sites all i mean uh, shows but there's there's still getting that set up so they're probably not going to have everything on there but poultry show central is one of the best ones um you can go on there and you can search by state all kinds of ways by region by state whatever all right we're going to answer this one question that everybody if you want to get hate mail here we go i'm nowhere close marie I think it says, I'm nowhere close to showing a bird, but I'm curious of the protocol for bringing a bird home to the flock once it's been in a show environment. Sell the bird or quarantine? Uh, I know some people, if they take a bird to a show, they don't bring it home, they sell it. Um, I quarantine mine, and I, I brought home many, many birds from many, many shows, and honestly, I never brought home a sick bird. If you take some basic precautions, your birds will be fine. And then by that, I mean, yeah. by that, I mean, you know, you treat them uh, last minute treatment for mites and lice. Uh, if, if you happen to see a sick bird in the show very quietly, you, you don't want to make a big deal out of it. Let show management know and they'll take it out. How long you quarantine afterwards? I quarantine mine for 30 days. 30 days. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Now we got ones for Jeff here. Have y'all had any experience with fowl getting ringworms? I was told they get a little white <coughs> substance and a few mine had on the corner of their mouths. So that's not the ringworm that I'm familiar with. So, you know, the ringworm mm -hmm. that I know uh, on mammals is you know, more of a fungal problem that affects the skin. So I don't have an answer for that. So I wonder if it's canker. I, I wonder if they're thinking about canker. I'm wondering if it's canker too. The only thing That's, I know that gives you a spot like that on the beak would be canker. If you have a picture, you could share it with us on Facebook. And maybe we could respond. Okay. All right. Sorry, we couldn't help there. All right. I think we're good. I think we are... Oh, no, not canker. Okay. No. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Send us a picture. We'll try to find out. Yeah. So, all right. Rip, you want to talk about next week? How our next no. show? All right. No. We're going to have a show on July 12th, and there will be a subject. It will be determined. <laughs> yeah. These We're two still here, working on that. These um, two here are going to be take, taken off and out of here. So That's Rick right. They're going on a much-deserved vacation, so it's just going to be Karen and I next time. And uh, well, hopefully we, we can try find to a guest, through without them. special guest, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so, all so, right. 
thank you all for watching. We appreciate you very, very much. Hope you have a good time. Enjoy your birds and stay cool in this hot summer weather. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation by Poultry Keepers 360. All rights are reserved. This production has been made possible in part through the generous support of the Fur Trail Company, manufacturers of gardening and livestock products that are better naturally.